All right, good afternoon. Uh, Facebook, this is Tommy Valentine from Historic Athens. Uh, a privilege of serving as the executive director of our 501c3 nonprofit that is dedicated to celebrating and conserving the community heritage of Athens, Georgia. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today for what is our 13th out of 55 episodes uh, where we're working to uh, examine, to document, to explore uh, this moment in Athens history, COVID-19. Uh, if you've watched our first 12 episodes, you know that we're speaking to various community leaders trying to provide a cross-section of this community so that you, the viewer, now, but also future researchers can look back at this moment and get an accurate picture of how COVID-19 affected the entire community of Athens, Georgia. Today, we're very fortunate to have a guest who has served as a community leader in multiple roles in Athens, Georgia, and we really looking, uh, look forward to introducing him to you if this is your first time talking to Lawrence Harris or getting to see Lawrence Harris. Uh, for many of you, it won't be. You've interacted with him in a variety of ways, and so uh, I'm sure you'll look forward to spending time with someone who feels like an old friend. A quick note, uh, if this is your first time watching the episode uh, or any episode of this program, I want you to know that this isn't just for you to watch. This is something you can also participate in. So all you need to do is right below this video, as long as we're still live, you can make a comment. You can make a, a, any kind of thought, feedback, anything like that, any question you have, just put it right below the video and we'll be able to actually share it as part of this live broadcast. A note here, uh, at the end of this 55 episode series, which airs every Monday, I'm sorry, every Monday through Friday, weekday at one o'clock until June 26th, at the end of this 55 episode series, all of these interviews, including today's, will be shared uh, as a digital archive with our local libraries and research institutions. And so by participating in today through your question or comment, you'll be part of that historic record, um, which is something that we appreciate you doing. So uh, I see that our audience is logging in and that they're here and we look forward to having them be a part of this process. Uh, so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and bring uh, Lawrence onto the call with us. So let's uh, do a warm welcome to uh, Lawrence Harris of Clark County School District, and he'll be joining us in just a moment. All right. Hey, Tommy. Hello. How how are you doing? I'm doing well. Besides not having a haircut, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Well, I can offer some tips uh, if you need any. Um, also, uh, I'm, I, one of the things that is, you know, I guess a silver lining or an enjoyable part of all these video chats that everyone in Athens and the world is having to do right now is I get to see how everyone has their books arranged. So <laughs> that, that applies to you as well. Um, Lawrence, uh, you've served as many different roles in this community. Uh, we were really honored to have you as our Mardi Gras Duke this year at our Mardi Gras masquerade at 40 Watt. So you'll maintain the title of Duke, uh, Duke Harris for the rest of the year. Um, but for those of you that aren't familiar with you or your work in the community, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your relationship with Athens is? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Tommy. So yeah, I've been in Athens now 10 years. Uh, it's crazy when I get to talk to my father about it. I've lived in Athens now longer than anywhere in my life. And wow. having been grown up as a military child, we moved to a lot of places. So I never thought, um, never thought I would settle down anywhere, but uh, Athens has truly become home. Uh, so I was introduced to Athens when I attended the University of Georgia as an undergraduate student. Uh, after I graduated, I went to work at Clark Central High School for two years as a college mm -hmm. advisor. And then I moved to Philadelphia and then I moved back to Athens where I started College Factory, which is a local nonprofit focused on helping first generation students access uh, two and four year colleges when they graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also work for the Clark County School District. And so uh, up until December, I was the CEO of our Career Academy here in Athens. And then now I'm the Executive Director of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships. Wow, that is not a small role for a school district of our size. Uh, you know, Lawrence, uh, how, you know, with each of those positions, they're obviously all education oriented, but so many of them are also about helping people advance to the next phase of their life or, or, or capture a college experience. Why is that something that you're so passionate about? That's a great question. I mean, I think it, my own personal experience, uh, trying to navigate the college access uh, ecosystem and trying to figure out, you know, I, I graduated from high school in Alabama and mm -hmm. decided to come over to Georgia, which was a big decision. Um, 
But I also think, you know, part of it is, is seeing that, you know, not all of our students uh, or even some families, some adults have access to uh, higher education the same ways uh, as everyone does. And so I just kind of felt a call to action, a personal call that I had to do whatever it takes to make sure everyone has an opportunity. Like I said, whether it's four-year college, two-year college, military, straight to the workforce, uh, you have the opportunity to do it. And so I, I just felt a personal call from my own childhood experience. Um, and I, I think I just overall just love working with kids. I mean, I, they, they put a smile on my face every day I get to see them. So that's probably the biggest thing I'm missing during this is I miss seeing the, the, the faces of the children. So. Yeah, you know, your role now as executive director focuses on community engagement, strategic outreach at a time where those are very difficult things to do. Um, how, how are you how are you coping or recalibrating or navigating this moment? Yeah, so most of the work has I mean, a lot of my work has been uh, exactly that partnerships, community engagement during this time. So we um the first week that we decided we were closing down the week after spring break, I mean, so many partners jumped into action to help with our meal service. Um, I mean, at this point, we served close to 200,000 meals since we began. Wow. And so a lot of food going out of our schools. Um, but that wouldn't have been possible without partners. I mean, that was really a test of, <laughs> I guess, whether I would be good in the position was being able to reach out to community partners, having those reach out to me personally, having those who would connect me to other partners so that way we could get food out to our kids and to our families. And so um, coping, I've learned to uh, create me myself a daily schedule. And so I'm just pretending that I'm at work every day because uh, I technically am at work. Uh, so Monday through Friday, I get up and I'm going over to the Greenway and I walk for yep. about three miles. And um, that's been really nice, uh, sometimes crowded. But, you know, when it's not, it's really nice. And then I, I come home and I'm, I'm on the computer for most of the day on Zoom calls and, and meeting with families and, and, and partners and just keeping it rolling. Absolutely. Yeah, I my wife and I and our daughter, we live only about a half mile from the MLK entrance to the Greenway. And so we're spending a lot of time out there. But I uh, let's just say that I'm having to use my ankles a lot. I'm having to zig and zag because it's definitely there's a there's a lot of people out there. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so, Lawrence, let's get back to you for just a moment. So uh, Athens is famously a city where people intend to come for a year or two, maybe four. And then they blink. It's been in a decade. They blink. It's been a lifetime. Uh you know, what are some of the highlights when you look back over the, your last 10 years of experiences here in Athens? What, so, what, what, what pulled you in? You know what I mean? I think the people and I think, you know, the culture. I mean, even as you mentioned Mardi Gras, I mean, you know, when, I don't know if people normally think Mardi Gras, I think Athens, but going even to that event and seeing so many people together having fun. I think Athens is a city where we're not so big that you can get lost, like, a, you know, in what is it, the big fish in a small pond, or right. I guess the opposite small fish in a big pond. Um, you can't get lost here. And so everyone seems to care about one another. And even when we disagree, I think everyone does it, or most people do it in such a respectful way that you can help to learn from different ideas, different cultures, different experiences. And so I think what really attracted me here, made me even want to stay, is just the people, the events. I love AFEST. I love, you know, the midnight bike ride. I love like there's so many cool different things going on, which, you know, maybe because we have so many nonprofits and groups in town, but it's it's like everyone has a different, cool, unique event that you can be a part of. And so you never have to just sit in the house all day. And then personally, I love our parks. I love being outside. Sure. And so I'm always at either Southeast Clark or the Greenway or Bishop or Memorial. Um, I'm, you know, Sandy Creek. So I love I love being outside. So Athens has a really nice homey feel to our parks. It's always very clean. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just think overall, it's just a really great feel and vibe. And then, like I said, the people I think overall have kept me here. I, I've, I've built some really great relationships, people I trust. Um, and then I know I can I can depend on in times of need. And now that my mom and brother are here in Athens with me, it makes it even better. So they moved up from Jacksonville, Florida, and they're lo loving being here, too. So it helps to have family here as well now. Well, I just want to say, you know, uh, for those of us that are Georgia fans, we've managed to steal you from Alabama. We've managed to pull up some people from Jacksonville, uh, you know, at, at this rate, gradually there'll be no more fans left for any other team. You're doing your part. Uh, Lawrence, <laughs> earlier you mentioned about the over 200,000 meals that you've served or that you've been involved in, uh, you know, helping plan. Can you talk a little bit about, I, I think that there's a lot of folks who don't realize the level of food insecurity we have in this community and the way that Clark County School District has an important role to play uh, in, in feeding children. Can you talk a little bit about why that's so important? 
Yeah, I mean, one, because of course, even though May 1st is our last day that we'll be assigning new instructional material, uh, in order for kids to learn and be engaged, you know, you have to be able to eat and you have to have food on your stomach and have the nutrition you need to kind of make it through the day. And so, I mean, we have a lot of students who depend on our breakfast and lunch programs and even our after school snack programs to get the, the food they need during the day, especially if mom or dad are at work or there may be, you know, experiencing, you know, some income um, issues at the household. And so for us to be able to provide food, I mean, the fact that we have such high usership is, I think, a very clear sign that it is a, it is addressing a need in town. Because uh, we also have people who are not part of CCSD who come and who ask if they can uh, pick up a meal. And so I think food insecurity exists with our students, but also exists with our residents and those who may not have kids at home. Uh, the one day, there's a Friday, a Thursday a few weeks ago where that one day by itself, we served 17,000 meals in a day. I mean, just imagine the amount of food and the fact that we did it within two and a half hours. So that's a lot of food in two and a half hours to go out. Um, but I also think for me, it was a really kind of feel good moment of realizing that we are addressing a need. We're not just doing this because it looks good or because of, you know, whatever other reasons there could be, but we're really doing this because there's a need out and we know we could help address it with our resources. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of food. There's, the food insecurity is a real thing. Um, and I think even figuring out for, you know, I, I laugh because even for my younger brother, I laugh about, you know, rationing food out. How do we, yeah. you know, we give food, how do we make sure you understand, like, if you get a meal for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you may not get another meal from us until that Monday. So helping to right. understand, like, what are the best ways to store your food? How do you make sure that you're kind of balancing out what you're eating every day? And you don't just eat it all in one day and then you're out for three or four days. So we were including in, in what's it called information in some of the bags for families yeah. uh, around COVID-19 and around food storage safety. So our hope was in the process of feeding, we're also educating. Yeah, Clark County, I, I think one of the unsung triumphs of Clark County is how they handle food. I know that, uh, I, you know, I went K through 12 in, in Clark County School District, fell in love with our food here. Briefly at one point was a substitute teacher. And as far as I was concerned, the best part about being a substitute teacher was eating uh, Clark County School lunches again. Um, uh, where else can you learn to put corn on your pizza? Um, right, but, exactly. Uh, <laughs> right. So... <laughs> Um, Lawrence, you know, uh, you said you switched over into this role in December. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I want to capture just for a moment, kind of the before and after, because obviously, you know, uh, Mike Tyson, I think is the one who's credited with saying everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. You know, yeah. um, uh, I'm sure that you, when, when you took this role, you thought it was going to play out a certain way. I'm sure that from what I've gotten to know about um, knowing you, you probably had some thoughts on what that first year was going to look like, what some of your goals were, you know, um, uh, if this hadn't happened, right. What are some of the things that, uh, that you were eager to dive into that you may have to wait until we're, we're back in person again. Do, do you have any thoughts like that? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I think, and I hadn't hadn't ever thought about that. Yeah. I mean, I, when I first started, some of the things initially started doing was developing a plan for the department, mm -hmm. and so you know, really focusing on revitalizing our partners in education program, um, getting some of our faith based community back involved in our schools as well as our youth serving organizations, uh, really building back up our adopt a school initiatives. And so there are a lot of programs that we had, we used to have in place years ago or that we have in place, but I lost some of the fire that I'd like to see um, that I really wanted to take the time out to reach out to current partners and, and partners who may not be at the table and see how can we get them involved. Um, also during this time, the goal was to start building out our advisory committee. So I really wanted to get a group of youth, uh, youth serving organizations together, kind of be a youth advisory committee, same with our faith-based groups and just different groups around, um, around our city. So that is going to have to wait mainly because that is a priority, but it's not a priority right now. Right. Um, and then I think also, you know, really wanted to do an end of the year celebration for our staff and our partners. Um, I was thinking red carpet style, but um, of course, with us not being able to get together, it'd be a strange red carpet to have. So you right. can't even walk on it. We just had a piece. Right. We can mail a piece of fabric, I guess, to each of each person. You just walk at it at your house. But uh, that's right. That's going to have to wait. But I thought it was really important because we, we really would have made it even before COVID-19. So much of what we do is, is thankful um, because we have such amazing partners and in, in nonprofits and faith based groups and, and even the government. And so we have some great partners out there. And so I just wanted to be able to recognize all the hard work that other people do to make sure our school system is successful. So 
it will happen. It just won't happen this year because that would have been sure. my original goal was May 1st on Friday. So that <laughs> definitely is not going to be this week. Um, so I think that was going to be a big focus of the work. And also part of my office's work is the local school governance team. So I, um, mm -hmm. our, my oversees our charter system status. We have a little over 240 LSGT members who are community members serving. So I wanted to do a lot of work on training and development and still plan on doing it, but it's going to have to wait probably till July or August. Sure. So uh, if, you're, if you've just tuned in, we're here with Lawrence Harris of Clark County School District. If you have any questions or comments, thoughts, words of encouragement, anything like that, we just really want to stress that uh, we'd love to hear from you as part of this broadcast. All you need to do is comment below this video. We can share those comments on screen and make it part of today's discussion. So uh, Lawrence, uh, you know, you talk about your desire to plug in all of these different groups into the Clark County School District process. You know, as a graduate of CCSD, I can speak with experience and how important that is. I know that from, you know, our field trips to our in-classroom programming, so many of the, the memorable experiences I had at CCSD were from surrounding community partners. I know you, you mentioned your, you know, our mutual love for the Greenway and for our park system. Uh, leisure services is a big part of that, uh, you know, big community partner. Um, what are some of the community partners that come to mind that you're most excited about uh, reinvigorating that relationship, bringing that fire that you said back, um, or just plugging in? What are some groups that you're excited to work with? So uh, the first one that comes to mind is, and in, in the fire is already there, the Clark County Mentor Program has done amazing work in CCSD for years, for a long time. And I know with their new executive director, uh, Joe Elrich, uh, he's doing some amazing leadership there and, and really focusing on what can the CCMP do to continue to support kids in CCSD in our schools? And we have so many mentors working with so many of our kids. So I'm really excited about that partnership. Uh, after meeting with several pastors and priests in town, I think really looking at the adopt a school program, uh, which was huge, you know, apparently years ago, even before my time, where organizations, churches, groups could adopt a school. And essentially they would, you know, fund a lot of their resources, their time, their volunteer work, whether you're being a reading buddy or a tutor or just being somebody friendly for a child to talk to. Uh, that was your school that you kind of owned that year. And so you would partner with that principal and those school staff and just make things happen to make, you know, make that year easier for students, but also help them make sure they have that support. So. I'm excited to get that back off the ground because the the desire to want to support and help is there. That's the fun part to me is like, it's not hard finding partners. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like you know, even before COVID-19, there are so many people wanting to be involved, wanting to figure out how can we do this work with CCSD? Mm -hmm. And it's just about plugging them in a strategic way, making sure that that relationship is supported, not just from the organization side and district side, but from the school level as well. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I've been working closely also with Aaron Barger with Envision Athens. Mm -hmm. I think the work that We've so we've kind of built from there as far as the foundation for workforce development, as well as early childhood education through literacy is really exciting as we see other organizations coming on board. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, even with the Career Academy, part of my role there as the CEO was to build partnerships with local business and industry. And so we have amazing industry partners. Uh, for those who don't know, I mean, Athens, we have a lot of manufacturers in town and just different businesses who are not just, you know, not, I mean, I love our small businesses and we also have these large businesses that are all really jumping in to provide support. And it's not just all monetary. Sometimes it's time. Um, I think some of the best things our local businesses have done and continue to do is come in and offer their social capital. They literally come in and they talk to a student about who they are, what they do, how did they get there, who they had to know to make that happen. And then for our kids, I think that allows them to open their minds and start mm -hmm. thinking about, OK, so it's not just about who I know, but also about who knows me. And so now that I can say I know the plant manager at Caterpillar, I know the, you know, gov uh, community relations director at UGA, you know, these are people I can now feel like I can call on or email and say, hey, can you help me out? Um, this is something I'm thinking about or now I'm interested in the career you do. Can you tell me more about it? So, um, I mean, so many partners. I mean, Love Chess and Community, ESP, the a Athens Council of Aging. We built some partnerships using a fellowship program at the Career Academy. So a lot of these partnerships exist. I'm just now my job is to figure out how do we strategically work work with our partners to figure out where's the best place that creates it as a sustainable model. Absolutely. So let, let's let's turn to this particular moment here and how things have changed. So um, one of the questions we've been trying to ask our guests is kind of your personal chronology with COVID, meaning for each of us, there was kind of a moment where we realized like, oh, this is real, you know, it, it, where it kind of crept into our awareness uh, 
a lot of folks have cited, uh, you know, spring break, uh, right, right around, uh, that, that time period. Uh, but for you, when did this start first kind of come to your attention and when did it start affecting your job? Uh, so it first came to my attention during spring break, uh, mainly because I was in a cabin in the woods working on my dissertation. Um, and I got a call from our superintendent and we were discussing, you know, COVID-19, some information that was going to come out from the governor's office. And um, I offered to take the lead on meal service. And so I, you know, I wanted to do what I could to help calibrate and create some type of system to keep kids fed because I knew they would, they were planning on being back that Monday. So this was a Wednesday. And so by that Monday, I knew we need to have a plan in place to get kids fed, uh, whether or not they were in school or not. And if they weren't in school, so luckily the model worked. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the real like human side, like the realities of COVID-19, it hit when I saw a mother and her four children walking to get food at one of our distribution sites. And I was at Hillsman and seeing them walk her walk up the street and she had four small children all under the age of five. So one was in a stroller and she had these three small ones behind them all holding hands and then walking over to get food. And I was able to have a conversation with her at a, at a safe distance, but it became really clear to me when the young kid was a young man was trying to give me a hug and his mom was trying to explain like why he couldn't hug, hug me, yeah. even though, you know, you know, kids just love to hug and, you know, so right. he's getting up, he's starting to cry. And then for her, she's getting food and she's explaining her situation um, and why, you know, the food service is so important to her and her family. And so that to me was probably the, even though we had, and this was not even the first day, I think this was like the second week of meals that this happened. Right. Um, I think that, you know, even though prior we were giving food out, it kind of was like, okay, it was more of like, this is what we do. We have a responsibility to do it. And I think that second week after seeing her, having a great conversation with her and her children, me realizing like it's it's much more personal. The need is very there. I mean, right. it is there. Um, so that that hit my heart really closely. And I think, you know, of course, I encouraged her to, you know, just keep me keeping her head up and there's going to be some opportunities and things coming out. Of course, before then, we hadn't heard about any type of government assistance that was happening uh, on the, the state or federal level. And so before that, you know, this is pre stipends and all that stuff mm -hmm. um, or pre, you know, stimulus checks. So. I think that was a really real moment. Even now, I mean, that was the first thing that popped in my head is like, you know, this was now seven, eight weeks ago that I think about it, but it's very clear in my mind that that one moment of like, we have to do this. We can't, we can't stop. Right. We need to continue to do whatever we can to support our families and kids. Yeah. I, you know, you just called to mind something. I, when I guess it was in the first couple of weeks of all of this, my wife and I took our daughter for a walk. Um, down the train tracks and, and kind of in the area where we live off in Newtown area off Barber. And we were walking through this little pocket park that's over by Pulaski Heights barbecue. My wife is a Clark County school teacher. She's a second grade teacher. And she saw one, one of the kids, if I'm remembering correctly, that was in the first class she ever taught. And she was super excited to see them and they were super excited to see her, but it was just this surreal moment where they couldn't, give each other a hug, you know, they couldn't have that, you know, I, I'm sure you can think back to teachers you've had that if you saw, you'd be pumped. Oh, and yeah. it was just, it was such a surreal thing to watch them both in that moment immediately wrestle with it, you know? And uh, so, yeah, so that moment with the the woman that you described and her kids, that's, that's real. Uh, yeah. So, so then, so at that point, you've taken on this other position. You've you've taken point on um, meals. Uh, is there anything, any reason particular why that was what you volunteered to do? No, I mean I, it's funny because I ask myself that to this day, only because it's still going on and it will continue through summer. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I felt I'm a very I'm a spiritual person, so I, I feel I go with my energy and yeah. I go with my gut. And I think you know, hearing our cabinet as our district leadership was talking through what it, what does this mean for our schools and our kids in my mind you know nutrition became such a an important thing nutrition and access to information and so building a system and the system was about meals but it was also about how can we get resources and items to our kids in an efficient way so we've used our meal distribution channels from the drive through sites to the bus delivery sites for giving out resources you know Infra, uh, instructional packets. We've given out diapers, toothbrushes, toothpaste. I mean, heads of lettuce. Uh, you know, we are literally using this system and channel as a way to get resources to our families and information, educational material. Um, so it's really about building something that could also get 
uh, items of beyond food to the hands of our kids in a safe way. And so, I mean, I, I feel, you know, part of the reason I signed up for it or I asked to take a lead was because I think it was just another thing to take off the plate of everyone else and something that I felt right. I had the capability. Uh, we have an amazing school nutrition director and transportation director. We have amazing uh, communications director. And so, but needing some, you know, getting someone who can be, you know, step in and kind of coordinate those parties together. And so I was happy to take on that role. Um, I worked with amazing people to really build this out and the need was there. So I think, I think I got off the call. I remember getting off the call and then five minutes later calling back in and saying, you know, if, if, if you're comfortable with it, I don't mind taking the lead on getting meals to the kids and I'll work out a model, I'll submit yeah. it and let's see what happens. And so it's, it has worked. And, you know, I've been helping other organizations and communities who have been trying to build. I did talk to other school systems who saw what we were doing here um, and showed them how we did our model too. So that was good. Um, so Lawrence, you know, as you mentioned, this is something that uh, that you'll be carrying through to the summer. Uh, you know, are you just taking things one day at a time at this point? Uh, how are you, you know, how are you looking around the corner at this point? So now, actually, um, now that the model is fairly um, well, well oiled, as they say, I'm actually in the process of building, uh, putting some systems in place that would allow me to take a little bit more of a step back. And be much more of a like governance man, governance side of it or manager side, and there are people on the ground who are doing a lot of the the day to day. Um, mm -hmm. And so now, what I'm really looking at is I'm working with my team on focusing back on what our office's purpose is. And so we're going back to some of those things we talked about in the beginning, looking at our partners in education. We're looking at our grants. We do give out a lot of grants annually in our office. So really, we work in that process, especially now that we recognize that many of the individuals who apply for our grants will probably do so in response to COVID-19. So they'll be looking at initiatives and partnerships with the schools or with community nonprofits and organizations. So making sure those funds are ready to go when, you know, organization says, I want to partner with this school. The school says, yes, there's grant funding available for us to build this type of initiative. So we're focusing on getting that foundation in place. And then also making sure when we get back to school next year, we're ready to kick off in a really exciting way, make sure those students have don't have any gaps in their learning or their instruction so they can start um, have a nice little head start when the school year uh, begins. So, yeah, I mean, every day is now, I mean, pretty much every day is filled and packed. I mean, I have two team meetings right. a week, uh, a meeting, meetings with my team. Um, and we're now rocking and rolling, getting ready for our local school governance team elections, which are next next week. And and then we'll continue to push forth from there. So, yeah, no, the, the work is now just really picking up. Uh, the meals were the meals was definitely a fun adventure, uh, but I'm also excited that there's some other things that we also have to focus on getting done uh, pretty soon, too. <laughs> and strategic planning. I'm also over our district strategic plan, so <laughs> working on that as well. That too. Why not? Yeah. You know, uh, it sounds like your job would be a difficult one to do, even if there wasn't all of this other stress in the air. You know, I know you mentioned your walks. What, what are some of the ways that you're managing the stress of this moment? How are you, how are you navigating that? So I actually wrote on my bathroom mirror, have grace for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I heard somebody talking about like, we need to have grace and I never heard that before or used in that context. Um, and so to answer your question, really sometimes I just have to tell myself to stop. Um, it's really easy. And it's probably the same way. It's really easy to get up in the morning, get into work and then work into the wee hours of the night and realize like there's so much other things happening around me in the world that I also could be paying attention to and should be paying attention to. So I've been picking up, um, I've always been a fan of mindfulness meditation. So I meditate uh, quite often, uh, almost daily. And then, you know, just having grace with myself that when, you know, it goes to that quote of like, my work is, I don't leave, I don't, I don't leave work when my work is done. I don't leave work when at a certain time I leave when the work is done. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, once I feel like I've accomplished enough, I keep my to-do list. And then I'm saying, you know what, it's five o'clock. I, I need to go focus on, you know, family or call some friends, check in on my right. grandparents. I can't, you know, I can't live this all day, every day because then I'll burn out and then I'm not useful to anyone. So just having to keep that in the back of my mind. Um, and I've been doing a lot of yard projects. I know Lowe's and Home Depot are making some great money because every time I go, they are packed. But I've yeah. I've got my stumps grounded. I've built a garden. I'm wor I worked on a mini pool in the backyard that like wow. stopped halfway through when I realized like that's not what I wanted. Um, so it's been a, a lot of fun, random house projects um, yeah. and a lot of terrapin and creature comforts too. <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. Thank God for curbside pickup with those folks. Right. Um, so <laughs> something else it sounds like you and I have in common. So uh, tonight when I put my daughter to bed, 
when all I'm going to want to do is turn on Netflix, what I'm going to instead have to do is I'm going to have to um, finish off an annotated bibliography that's due to my major professor as part of my prospectus. And um, this is, I know you mentioned you were in a cabin working on your dissertation. Um, among uh, How are you juggling all? Because the thing about it is, it sounds like you are someone who keeps yourself almost to the breaking point anyway. So to have this on it on top of it too, how, how are you juggling grad school with all of this? Yeah, so I mean, this is live stream. So if my major professor's on here, I apologize. <laughs> I, I have struggled, I have to say, it's been, a, it's been a struggle to balance just school. I think school, the college factory, of course, which is you know, my nonprofit, with mm -hmm. the work I do for the Clark County School District, as well as just being a normal person and wanting to have relationships with family and friends. And so I have not juggled it well. I'm in the part of, um, I'm now at this, in the perspectives development stage. And so I have a writing plan that I have to continue to revise because I tell myself like, okay, by Saturday, I'll be done with chapter three. And then by Saturday, I'm done with like chapter 1.5. And so, um, right. but I have finally settled on my topic, which is great. I've gotten some really great guidance from my uh, advisor. And so he's been amazing helping me to develop this mixed method study. Um, but I find that, you know, sometimes I'm focused on school and the moment I do that, and then my work cell phone rings and then right. I'm jumping into action and then I close all those tabs or I minimize them and then I'll come back to them a couple of days later. Um, so it's been hard, but it's something I really want to do too. So it's, I, I look forward to, to finishing this journey of graduate school because it's something I've worked really hard for and I have invested a lot of time, energy and money into it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a struggle. I said, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. Yeah. It's hard remaining peak performance and productivity right now. I, I do want to yeah. mention, we just saw a comment, um, from commissioner Rita Thornton, who we're excited to interview on a later uh, episode of the broadcast. She just mentioned she was sharing, uh, this episode on her channel. So we really appreciate that. Thank you, Avita. Um, Thanks, Avita. yeah. And, and we look forward to interviewing her. Uh, so yeah, so. Uh, Lawrence, bear with me one second. What we like to do is just very briefly, I know you mentioned the nonprofit thing, since we're a nonprofit too. We do like to just mid-broadcast recognize our sponsors. So we're just going to do this very briefly um, before we continue into the last third or so of this program. Uh, so uh, if for those of you that don't know, Historic Athens is a 52-year-old nonprofit. Uh, we have operated in the Athens area since 1967, uh, working to uh, celebrate and conserve uh, the community heritage of Athens. Sometimes that heritage comes in the form of a building that we're working to preserve or celebrate the preservation of. Sometimes it comes in the form of public programming, education, and advocacy. Um, a lot of times, though, just like today, it's about celebrating and conserving stories. Uh, our stories and our heritage help to define us. So uh, we want to thank all the sponsors you see on the screen here. These are our annual sponsors. Uh, they give to ensure that we survive. And their gifts earlier this year are the reasons our lights are still on and our staff, our team is still hard at work. Uh, if you'd like to become a sponsor, you can visit historicathens.com. Uh, you can message me on Facebook. You can send us a direct message through our Historic Athens Facebook page, whatever you feel comfortable with. Also, I just want to mention, in addition to our sponsors, we're fortunate to have over 300 local donor members uh, and you can become a donor member for as little as $5 a month. I promise you, because we look at our budget, uh, 52 years is great, but you're still uh, surviving year by year. And so every single donor, every single dollar is critical to us continuing our mission. Uh, please consider supporting us. Visit historicathens.com. We'd be honored to have your support. And then one last note just related to our organization. Uh, in June, we'll be celebrating our 51st annual preservation awards. You've probably seen those banners around town, the white and blue banners celebrating local historic preservation. If you're aware of a important local preservation project that was completed this year, a publication that was completed this year, or if you'd like to nominate someone for our second annual places in peril list, if you know of a historic place that's in danger, uh, please visit historicathens.com, make a nomination, uh, and we'd love to celebrate uh, that historic space that you bring to our attention. So. Uh, thank you very much. And we appreciate all our donors and sponsors that make programming like this possible. 
Uh, and then today's episode, while we bring Lawrence back on the screen, uh, th- each week of this 11-week series has been made possible by the generous donation of a different individual or organization. This week, including today's broadcast with Lawrence, uh, has been made possible f- by the office of Mayor Kelly Gertz. So we really appreciate uh, Mayor Gertz's office for supporting this broadcast. Yeah, yeah. Stay strong. Um, yeah. So, um, Lawrence, uh, you know, we, we have about 19 minutes together. Uh, before the broadcast wraps up. And so I I wanted to uh, go through a series of questions we're asking each of the guests, and then we can use the remaining time however we, we want. But uh, the first question I have is a, is a little bit of a light one, but our guests have seemed to have fun with it. So uh, I know you mentioned uh, Terrapin and, and Creature Comforts. I know we have you know lots of great breweries here in Athens, Authentic, Southern Brewing, the list goes on. Um, there are so many small businesses struggling. Some are open, some are not. Some are available for curbside. Some are trying to become available for curbside. I saw the place, which is one of my favorites, is going to be available for curbside starting Friday. When you think of your favorite local businesses, your favorite places to eat or to go, if shelter in place were to end tonight and you were assured that everyone was safe, everyone was healthy, and tomorrow morning you could go back to any place in Athens, including the places you haven't been, what would be some of your first stops? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so I've enjoyed Maple and Homemade's curbside pickup. I will say that's been mm-hmm. some of my favorite. Um, where would I go? Mm. Yeah, I probably would go to South Kitchen for some Brussels sprouts because I do enjoy yeah, the Brussels yeah. sprouts. I'll be stop by there for Brussels. I would go to Maple because I just I really love their uh, box car, and I feel like you know it's just the right balance of like carbs and calories to make me feel like I didn't do too too bad. Um, I love uh, homemade biscuits. So I'd have to stop by there to get the carbs that I didn't get at Maple. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd have like a whole and then Kelly's. I'd get some barbecue chicken because I think that's like like one of my favorite proteins. I'd probably go to Kelly's pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think restaurant wise, that's where I'd go um, for the restaurants, and then I think for entertainment, um, I really love Cine. Yeah, as personally, is this is one of the coolest places. So I, I understand you know movie theaters are a really hard place to go to, and be socially distanced, but I probably just right. want to go watch a show there and just relax and be in a space outside of my house. There's been a, not, a lot of Netflix in here, so I'd love to go out and watch a movie. I love movies too, so going to Cine and just seeing some type of film and enjoying being around other people. Um, and then I may stop by uh, one of my you know spots downtown for some salsa <laughs> on the way out. Go. So I'm already going to peel out this full day of what a lot of eating and then some dancing in a movie. Yeah. I, I like this. You'll, you'll dance off all those carbs. Uh, those, those exactly. Big- exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds, it's hard to beat that day for sure. Um, yeah. More- uh, the second of three questions I have for all of our guests uh, has to do with local historic sites. So um, part of what we do is historic preservation. And in the historic preservation world, one of our concerns is right after a moment like this, especially right after a recession, uh, people tend to want to build fast and, and fast and quick and sometimes that can endanger historic places. So we've been asking each of our guests to list some of their favorite local historic places in Athens, whether, you know, the Morton theater or downtown Athens, whatever comes to mind. Um, and it, with the idea that someday 10, 15, 20, maybe 50, 60 years from now, there may be somebody watching this interview uh, for that audience. What are some of the historic places that you hope they can still go? What, what are some of your favorite you know, uh, historic places around Athens? That's a good question. I mean, I think, I mean, you said the Morton, which is one of my favorites for sure. Um, And now I'm trying to think there's a building that's near recent Pope. I think that's um, used to be an old Masonic Lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, yeah, the the Knox Institute. Yeah, yeah, the Masonic Lodge. I know it's not open to the public, but I love architecture. So I think that's always a really cool building just to like drive by and look and just imagine what what it used to be when, you know, Back in the, I would say back in the day, but like back in the sure. day. Um, so I love that. Like I said, and you said the more in. Um, 
I love like even seeing some of like our, um, and as I don't know the names of most of the buildings, so I apologize. I mean, I, I just love seeing some of the architecture that's more mm -hmm. uh, historic downtown. So I love seeing the, and it's really off of downtown. Like when you get to, um, what's the street? Dowdy Street and you go further mm -hmm. back uh, towards, um, I'm sorry, geography is my worst, like my worst subjects. So I'm just going to tell you that I'm terrible at maps. That's but, okay. I, I, uh, I can't tell you a street name in this city and I've lived here since yeah. I was five. So yeah, yeah, right. I was just thinking like I've been here all these years, and I, I'm really bad with like street names. Um, but I just love like any of the, like the old historic buildings that have like were old factories. I love like kind of like the near the old Chase and Boulevard area. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I just there's this. I think the, I love I love what historic Athens does because I think it preserves not just the history of a building, but I think there's just so much life and energy and stories to be told of what a facility has been and what it is today. And so. Personally, I, I just love what you all do because I think it allows us to preserve something that once it's gone, we can't get it back. And I think that's so important uh, for people to recognize is that, you know, once somebody tears something down or builds something, oh, well, this is our new modern, you know, <laughs> say McDonald's. Yeah, that's cool. Right. But now we, we never can go back to what was there before. And there's so much history and stories to, to Athens that, you know, I love the West Broad building. I love the way that looks, even though I know, you know, there'll be work there. H.G. Edwards, of course, where I work at. So I can't wait right. for people to be back in there because I always love that site. And of course, I'm biased because I worked there and I was a CEO of our career academy. But just, you know, walking those halls, going down that what I used to call heritage hallway and seeing all the graduates from 1969 and 1951. Wow. I mean, that's that's impressive. That's history. That's our history. So, I mean, I look forward to people being able to get back in those buildings, students getting back into the schools and seeing and just remembering um what it was and where we are today. Absolutely. Wow. Well said. Yeah. I, uh, the not, you know, the Knox Institute that you mentioned, the uh, Masonic Lodge, that was actually on our place in Perilist last year. Uh, we were really excited to partner and con to continue to partner with Marvin Nunnally and the Masonic Lodge over there to help fully restore that building. Really great pick. It, the architecture is phenomenal. The story is phenomenal. At one point, I think it was the only African American accredited high school in the state of Georgia. Uh, really just, uh, yeah. So of course you would choose an educational site. That would be right, right. <laughs> right up your house. So, uh, so, uh, Lawrence, my last question, and I think it'll, it'll take us the rest of this episode to explore. Uh, let's think back for just a moment to that, that archivist, that researcher, that student in the future, that's looking back at this interview or looking back at this moment, what should they know about Athens in COVID-19 and 2020, what should they know about this moment in history? Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that um, our community really came together during this pandemic. And I think, you know, having, if you look in the newspaper, whether it's Flagpole or on Athens or, you know, Red and Black, and you just, you read of, of all the different things that were happening prior to COVID-19, uh, but then the moment it struck and we had our, even our first case here in Athens, even prior to that, you can see, excuse me, a shift to so much unity and collaboration among organizations there. But there's never not one time have I seen anybody say this is what we like. This is us doing it like, you know, so there's no one out there for ego reason or for credit. And so I think person in the future looking back on now, what I would want them to understand about even the energy that I feel here in Athens is that there's a very high sense of unity that I hope will carry out even after COVID-19. But there's also seems to be this eradication of like, it's a, it needs to be all about me, all about my ego, what my organization or what we did. And even our organizations who, you know, sometimes may be about just getting the money or the recognition or the spotlight, all that has seemed to go out the window because everyone's doing what they can do to rally around supporting individuals, whether it's the young, to the aging, to the middle age, um, I mean, to those who are low income, to moderate, to high. So, I mean, it's just a, a huge um, ordeal. And I think, you know, some folks may say, oh, well, yeah, in a pandemic, people naturally come together. I don't think that's the case everywhere. I don't know if you could go to every city in our country and say that the communities came together around right. to make sure people were taken care of. But actually, if you watch the news and, you know, they would see some communities are doing the opposite. There's some for and there's others who are going against what the government's saying or going against what the community is trying to do or why are we trying to provide meals or why do. And so. I think, you know, that to me has been like my biggest highlight. And it's again, made Athens truly feel like home is that 
no, I mean, in the midst of it all, everyone came together. There's these weekly update calls. I mean, almost every day I'm going to call for something where everyone's calling to talk about how can we work together to make this happen. Um, so that's the one thing I want future researchers to know is that there were key organizations that were at the table, but then even some of our smaller organizations and grassroots level orgs came mm -hmm. and said, hey, you know, normally we only serve five clients, but we'll put whatever resources we have towards this if it means helping more people. And so it wasn't a what do I need to do to make this happen game? It was like, what can we do to make our world and our community a better place? So that's just what I would say. Please just remembering that Athens, I love the idea of like Athens for all. I know we have like one Athens and Athens for everyone, but I love the Athens, I love you sticker and symbol yeah. symbol. Cause I think truly this has shown how many people love our community and, and care about it. Yes. It's a city that we love to love. Uh, you know, I was thinking earlier, uh, I mentioned about my, my wife, Laura and I, and it's funny, right before I took this job, <clears throat> I had been given a moratorium on buying Athens things <laughs> because it's so easy to just fill your house full of Athens things. But since taking on historic Athens, I've tried to argue that, come on, I mean, you know, uh, this is a city you love. You want to just surround yourself with Athens stuff. People do not feel lukewarm about this community. And we're glad that we have oh, people yeah. like you. Yeah. So um, okay. a few things, a few quick things. We've had some comments here. I just want to bring in as we're uh, approaching the end of this broadcast. Uh, so uh, Gary Birch, Gary and Jen Birch, uh, big supporters of our organization. We love Gary Lawrence. Uh, you, you immediately smiled. Who doesn't love Gary Birch? Um, Gary and Jen supported the first week of this broadcast. Gary wrote, wow, with people like Lawrence and Tommy, the future of Athens is bright. Thank you. Thank you. Great conversation. You're too kind as usual, Gary. I agree that thank Lawrence uh, is helping ensure a bright future. Uh, and we're glad that you tuned in, Gary. Thank you. Um, and then we have a comment here from Julie. Uh, uh, Julie says, uh, Lawrence is such an incredible asset for the students in Clark County. Uh, this community is so fortunate. He calls it home. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so uh, clearly, you know, uh, Lawrence, you came to a community 10 years ago that wasn't your own. And from some of the comments we're seeing, you can tell how valued you are in Athens. I, I guess as we approach the end of today's broadcast, I'd ask, uh, you know, it sounds like this feels like home now. Uh, what does it feel like to experience something like this happening to your home? Yeah, it's scary. Um, I mean, I think just even, I mean, again, I go back to the beginning of the call. Um, some of the first things I thought about were the kids I've, I've, I've worked with in my time here and their families and, you know, the moms and dads and uncles and aunts and grandparents. And I think about those who, you know, aren't at, may not be as fortunate as others. And so I think that to me has been my, my big why for my work, but it also kind of just continues to say, like, when I think about my home and I think about it, it, it's scary to think that there are others out there, no matter what we're doing, there's always some out, someone out there who still is not getting what they truly, what they need or, or, or truly deserve to, to make it by. And so um, I, I don't technically enjoy the feeling, <laughs> I have to say, um, I would, I look forward to the day where the pandemic is over, but I also hope that it's a time of reflection for community and educational leaders and, and, and government leaders to really look at, well, what did we learn from this process? What are ways that we can rebuild and, and create new systems that support more families, more students, more, more, more of our citizens in a much more equitable way? And so some of the things that, you know, you, I've noticed over the past couple of weeks are just systems that have existed for far too long that unfortunately, those who are less fortunate are the ones who end, end up with the short end of the stick. So um, I'm hopeful. I mean, as much as I'm saddened by this pandemic, I'm also hopeful that we'll learn, we'll make some changes um, for the betterment of people. And I do want to add a real quick time because I realized that something for my day to day or like when you said, once this thing is over, the first place yeah. I will go is the barbershop. <laughs> like I will <laughs> like, I have missed my barbers on Facebook. So key man, if you're watching, I cannot wait to get back in that chair. I have never, I very rarely would even go out the house with my hair looking so, so crazy. But uh, I had this, I wanted to add that in there too. I'll go to the barber shop yeah. first and then go to all the restaurants. So, <laughs> okay. That's right. Yeah. You can't go out salsa dancing if you're not, if you don't have it uh, set up and correctly. Cannot. 
Um, so, uh, Lawrence, uh, one last question here for you. Uh, if somebody's watching this and they wanted to support CCSD at this time or support uh, the community of schools and, and students and teachers and uh, administrators and professionals that make up our school district, is there anything that comes to mind, any way that a community member might be able to show their support at this time? Yeah, so we have, um, I mean, time and ideas always can send them my way. So if you have any ideas, feel free to email me, uh, harrislaw at clark.k12.ga.us. Um, but I mean, we always are in need of resources and we'll be doing our meal service program until the end of the summer. Uh, we've had amazing partners like Athens, uh, Diaper, Diaper Bank Athens. And so they've been, sorry, my cat is like, pulling on my legs. I'm trying to kick her down. Um, we've been, uh, had amazing partners like uh, the Diaper Bank, who've su supported by donating uh, diapers to us that we can give out. So if you have any items or you have anything um, that your organization can provide that we can give out to our families and students at our distribution sites, we even give out information. And so I think, you know, partners sometimes understanding it doesn't have to just be money. You know, if you have some kind of information that you think would help, whether it's the bilingual services, GED services, some something you're offering online that could be helpful for our students and, and families, send it my way. I'd love to have copies of it made so we can put it at our meal sites and putting on our delivery bus routes. And we'll give it to the kids. We'll give it to the family so they know, hey, we're all still here in this together. I know you're sheltering in place, but here's some opportunities and access. So send it my way. And then of course, you know, if you do want to donate money, we have enough Thanks to Sarah McKinney, we have a, a fund set up at the Community Foundation. It's called the Clark County School District COVID-19 Relief Fund. So you can always donate there. And that money will be used towards our recovery efforts this upcoming fall, but also to support our staff right now who, you know, traditionally would have uh, paychecks coming in from summer school or summer programs. Absolutely. Well, Lawrence, I'm going to share one last comment on screen. And I, I think it speaks for the way a lot of folks feel. Uh, Lindsey Brandon said, Lawrence is one heck of a community leader. And friend, love tuning in today. Uh, so uh, thank you, Lindsay, for that encouragement for Lawrence with the million things he's got to do. Uh, we hope that you'll tune in tomorrow at one o'clock for our interview with Cheryl Leggett of the Girl Scouts. Uh, we're really excited about having that conversation. Uh, Lawrence, thanks for taking time out of your busy calendar today to talk to us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. Well, of course, it was our pleasure. So uh, thanks everyone who tuned in. We hope you'll tune in again tomorrow at one o'clock clock. Uh, Lawrence and I are going to go off air at this time, uh, but we really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay safe, be healthy out there, and we'll see you tomorrow at one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.